Hi everyone, it's Heather Darnall. Welcome back to my art channel. Thank you for joining me for another video. So today's painting has already been completed and is very similar to the paintings I've done in the past where I don't really explain or go over how I'm doing anything. I'm just worshiping and painting um, for you guys to watch the, pro the process come to life and just kind of enjoy the music going in the background as well. Um, rather this time, instead of music to accompany the painting, I have a testimony playing for you to listen to instead. A shocking, to say the least, testimony. It's really quite um, breathtaking. It's about, it's literally between life and death. And I really need to um, emphasize that there's a significant message that goes with this testimony. So I hope you enjoy it. Um, this testimony is given by a Dr. David Gibbs. And um, from what I read about him, he has over four decades in the ministry and he is the president and founder of Christian Law Association. And he was super kind to authorize me to use his testimony as I was painting this picture and have it playing for you in the background. Um, I really can't thank him enough, honestly, because without his testimony playing, I really just feel like this painting is just, it would be null, it would be meaningless. I mean, really just, it's just kind of blah. And um, I mean, it, it might be pretty cool for, you know, aviation and weather enthusiasts like myself, but, and that's a, we're a small group of people as it is, but um, yeah, if, if, if I didn't have the testimony going in the background, this really wouldn't only be, this would really only be appreciated by a group of people this big that would appreciate it as is. So someone in my Bible study group not long ago happened to hear this testimony, this very testimony, and um, shared it with the entire group. So what I received happens to be the edited or condensed version of it so that we get the gist because not everybody has the time or wants to sit through an entire sermon just to hear every bit of the details, um, hence a shorter version. Uh, but if you do wanna to listen to the sermon and testimony in its entirety, I will be more than happy to share that link in the description for you. Now, I'll be honest, after I heard this testimony, I wept. I definitely had quite a few tears coming down, uh, rolling down my cheeks there and immediately I felt called to paint this. The, the message had such an impact on me. Um, and I just wanted to paint this message for what it represents, but also it represents aviation. And if you didn't know that about me already, I happen to be a big time aviation nerd. Um, and so it really was more of like a twofer for me. So it, it was really just an awesome way to um, be inspired between a combination of the message and it being just an aviation inspired painting. Um, I actually learned to fly when I was 18 years old and my first career was in air traffic control. I had spent years around general aviation and corporate aircraft and most non-aviation minded people would probably know that better or those better as like private jets, you know, that type of thing. But believe it or not, my heart throbbed for airliners. I actually wanted to be a 747 captain for the longest time. And they are still, as a matter of fact, my favorite aircraft to date, the 400 series, of course. But anyway, and it's so hard to believe they're actually becoming obsolete. Anyway, I'm totally getting away from the point here. I had a total squirrel moment. Um, so, but I thought what a great opportunity for me to provide you guys sort of like a visual, so to speak, or an overall snapshot of his experience, um, or at least that you just walk away with some great insight. Now, the testimony is basically Dr. Gibbs accepting a freebie ride home um, from when he was away in business all the way out in the Aleutian Islands, so the little trailing islands off of Alaska there in the Pacific Ocean. Um, so a pilot came up to him, approached him and, and offered him to take him a ride home in his small airplane instead so that he could save money and just to avoid the overall hassle and trouble of going on an airliner and going through airport security and all those shenanigans that no one else wants to go through, but we do anyways. Anyways, uh, but my best guess on from the description that he gives from his full sermon and testimony of the aircraft that he flew on um, would be an Adams a 500 aircraft. So it is a dual engine aircraft, but unlike what you and I are, or most of us are used to imagining or seeing as far as having an aircraft having two engines, meaning uh, one on the left and the other on the right, rather this one has one in the front and the other one in the back. So if you have ever seen that movie that I think came out in 2006, it doesn't even matter when it came out, but there was a movie called Miami Vice and 
the stars are Colin Farrell and Jamie Foxx and there is a very brief scene as in like five seconds brief of Jamie Foxx in the cockpit and then like the next three seconds later it's basically an overview of that aircraft flying at altitude that would be your Adams A500 aircraft but if you know your aircraft too you'll know that I didn't paint an Adams A500 aircraft I painted a Cessna aircraft instead because that's what I learned to fly in and so that really just kind of brought back memories for me plus I didn't hear the full testimony at the time as I was painting this and so I just thought oh whatever I'll just paint what I'm familiar with but I'm really glad that I did come across his full sermon and testimony because like I said man it was a great message really well delivered and I'll be honest there were several times that I actually had a pretty good chuckle out of it as well now as far as the weather scenario goes uh, it's really hard to tell exact what he flew through because in one version he says storms and the other one he says bad weather weather's under the minimums uh, but in this version you'll hear him describe his experience that he was flying through storms but the bottom line is I'm just painting my interpretation of it and either way I wouldn't want to be in his shoes flying in unfavorable weather so yeah no thanks <laughs> uh, but more so to set the tone of the storms and how equivalent they are in our life's daily chaos in our culture so to speak and how it feels like the world is just growing darker and darker hence the resemblance of a very dark atmosphere in my painting uh, hopefully you heard my most recent message in my last video where I had a message on personal storms um, you'll find that video where I was doing a seafoam based acrylic pour and I just feel like that message combined with this one really, really pairs well together. So hopefully you had a chance to hear that as well. So Dr. Gibbs explains that shortly after takeoff, the pilot basically turns to him and explains that he's unfit to fly in clouds, uh, which they were going up into and then it was like cloudy all day even. But he basically come, becomes incoherent, just unable to fly, flat out inoperable, leaving him to fly the airplane by himself in stormy weather to top it off so talk about a double whammy now if you feel pulled to pick this testimony apart like i have seen in comments when i originally received this testimony might i suggest that you are very clearly missing the overall message and the content of his testimony um, so i'm asking you to please refrain from any negativity i make a valiant effort to keep my channel a very safe and positive space for my viewers plus none of us were there anyways to say anything otherwise so there's that but more importantly if you read your bibles and you call yourself a christian down to the core then you'll know that the walls of jericho did in fact come down simply by the israelites walking around the city and shouting you'll know that entire armies have been defeated with as little as two men and you'll know that jesus did in fact feed five thousand people with five loaves of bread and two fish and had leftovers. Obviously there's more examples to share there, but really these are only mentioned just to drive the point home um, and how we tend to not put God into our equation of our life experiences. I mean, come on, let's reflect back to the gospel of Luke chapter one, verse 37, where it reads, for nothing is impossible for God. And in a time that definitely seemed impossible for Dr. Gibbs to make it home alive, God made sure the impossible was possible. Looking back at it, it's very evident that God used other pilots within the vicinity to tell him, you're gonna make it. Just listen to the voice to give him that reassurance that he needed. And that's one thing I love about God is that how he is able to use us to speak to other people um, and in such unique ways that we don't even realize it. Um, so I couldn't help but to write dual scripture on this piece to tie it all together um, as my ministry snack. And the first one comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 27, which happens to be a little bit of scripture that Dr. Gibbs uh, shares himself in his testimony. And it reads, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Now, John is one of the 12 disciples that uh, he wrote his testimony about the life of Jesus when he was here on earth. Um, which are in the Gospels that are uh, consist of the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, now, in this, this passage here, Jesus is basically trying to explain how he knows his own and that his own know him and often uses a shepherd to be an example for his followers um, and for us just to have a better understanding, a, a better visual. Now, think about it. It makes perfect sense, too. So if you have kids or even pets, you know that they respond to your voice because they're familiar with it. They, they trust you to respond to your voice because there has been a relationship established. 
um, therefore they follow it. Now, believe it or not, some of you already know this, but most of you probably don't that we used to be beekeepers. And most of you who even knew that we were beekeepers, or now that you know, didn't already know that honeybees actually have a facial and voice of recognition so that they can also establish a relationship with their keeper, which is why I never really suited up when I did my hive inspections. Now, I say follow because Jesus also means his people follow his voice even when they can't see him. Now, I can relate to that because when I call for my son and he can't see me, he, re he tunes everything else out and he relies on my voice so that he can find me because it's a natural instinct. So given that it's a natural instinct and my son knows me and I know my son, Jesus knows his children, which he also refers to as his sheep. He knows our, our personalities. He knows our quirks, our patterns, our behaviors. We are predictable to him because he knows us. He made us. He made us in his image. And nothing about us either comes to him as a shock. Like there's no, oh, dang, I didn't see that coming. Rather, it's on the contrary. It's usually that we don't see the things coming from Jesus because we're so unattentive. So given the fact that Jesus knows everything about us, past, present, and future, um, from the get-go, and if we have the desire to get to know him intimately, then it will be very, very clear to recognize his voice because it will be the only voice that we will naturally respond to, just like our kids when they naturally respond to our voice because of the familiarity, because the relationship in it. So just be careful because take heed to this. This is a major warning. The enemy tries with everything he's got to also disguise himself as the voice of Jesus. And I don't, that's his workshop, you guys. So really, seriously, take heed to this. Um, he disguises his voice as to sound like Jesus. Now, I don't mean like how it sounds the same. No one knows what he sounds like anywhere, sounded like when he was here anyways, because obviously that was then and this is now. But we are still under a daily spiritual warfare. And part of that warfare is understanding and knowing the, the differences between the voice not by the sound, so not like how people can confuse me and my sister when they hear us on the phone. That's not what I mean. I'm talking about um, how the enemy uses his speech, his wording, his tone of voice, so that he can continue to be deceptive and keep you you know, down on that path that's really leading you in the wrong way. Um, so if you're not close to him, then it's likely you're still fighting voices in your head and not realizing that you're following a whole other entity's voice being the enemy without even realizing it. Now for the other part of the scripture, which comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. And it reads, On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out from the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain while Moses went up to God. The Lord called him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you should say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation." These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So now in the book of Exodus at this time, it has been very recent that the Lord has since freed his people, um, the Israelites, out of harsh bondage and slavery from the land of Egypt. Um, so if you have not really any idea or you're not very familiar with the house of Jacob and how the Israelites even got into Egypt to get into slavery, I highly suggest you listen to the message in which I was painting a portrait of what Shifra and Pua could possibly look like. Um, but anyways, I believe that will help give you a lot of answers in that department. But anyway, so it had been around three months. They've been fresh out of Egypt and God um, proceeds to talk to Moses and talk to him about the past, present, and future. Now, what I mean about the past is that he is clearly reminding Moses about how he's protected them and how he's always provided for them and that he's capable of anything and everything and how he was with his children every step of the way, getting them ready to leave Egypt and as they were leaving Egypt so that they would never forget. Now, I find myself doing the same to my son. Um, just reminding him of the things that we've done for him so that when he gets all whiny and complaining, you know, he has some things to reflect back on. 
Um, so this scenario makes sense that God would tell him to tell the people that. And sometimes people just need, you know, a friendly reminder to realign their, their faith and their peace. He then tells Moses about the presence and the significance on obeying his voice and keeping his covenant. Then, referring to the future, then if they obey his voice, they shall be a special treasure, a holy nation. So in other words, they weren't just going to be set up for life, but also for eternity simply by obeying his voice. Now, back in those days, a high priest was big time and Moses was the Israelites high priest, so to speak. So they were really significant because they spoke to God um, or they spoke to God on the behalf of the people and the people spoke to the priest so they could talk to God about whatever. So it's sort of like having a middleman here and Jesus is basically our high priest. He's our middleman because we have to go through him to get to God the Father. And he says so himself, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And he also says, I and the Father are one. So there is no ranking issue there just because we have to get through Jesus to get through the Father. It's just a very specific command that we are to obey and should be grateful that Jesus basically has, a, a, we have him to represent God and that he represents us before the Father so that our prayers are heard and so that we are deemed innocent before him as long as we believe in him. Uh, so put it this way, it's really a corny example. It's the only one I can really kind of wrap my mind around as far as trying to make as much sense as possible. Um, just as Jesus does too when he gives example like the shepherd and the sheep to follow his voice. Anyway, so let's just pretend that you know, Jesus is the guy that, uh, you know, gets us backstage. He's the one who unhooks that little red velvet rope when we want backstage VIP access. And we only get that VIP access through Jesus. He's the only guy that can give us that privilege um, or that access. So, and when we believe in Jesus and we believe in the Holy Trinity, not only do we get that red carpet treatment, so to speak, but we are also deemed innocent before the Father because he personally escorted us there. And when we were face to face with him, there he's basically telling the Father, I guess what, they're with me, everything's good, we have no worries here, I got this in the bag, they are all with me, they are my sheep, they are my children, we are one family. But more than being a middleman, high priests were also a representation of God, just how I explained how Jesus is a representation of God. Um, and he, the high priests were also a representation of the people. So if people obey his word, they will physically see and experience how God blesses and protects his people. So it's, in other words, it's, it's basically a representation about who he is to other nations, sort of kind of like flaunting special treatment type thing, you know, because of an established relationship and keeping of his covenant and their promise to him. Therefore, he would make them a holy nation. So in other words, God gives them a representation to other nations so that other people will look in and be like, oh, geez, I want, I want in on that. You know, what do I have to do to be a part of those blessings and have a lot of all that protection going on? Um, so that they would be blessed by him as well. And the people would represent God on how they show their love for him by keeping their promise and keeping their covenant so that they would receive all that God wants to give to them and show them all the ways that he can protect them, basically making them untouchable. I mean, talk about having the best life insurance policy ever. You know, so often we take the term obey out of context and we make it sound like that we are just want to be in charge of someone and how we just kind of want to demonstrate a controlling behavior. But check this out. This Think about it this way instead. I expect my son to obey me because I love him. He's mine. You know, there's a reason I expect him to hold my hand across the street because I love him. He's safe. He's mine. There's a reason I'm a food snob and I'm very particular about what goes in his mouth because I'm responsible for maintaining the health the way God designed his body to function. And it would be on me that if I just were negligent on what he, what goes in his mouth so that he would be more subjective to the illnesses that I could have prevented. You know what I mean? So there's a reason that I tell him, you know, um, I want you to do what I'm telling you to do so that I may shower you with my blessings so that when you obey me, I can literally demonstrate 
in more ways than you can imagine what I want to do for you because I love to give. So does it make sense to just shower our kids, you know, with all the things that we want to give them when they're totally disrespectful and out of line? No, or at least not in my house. And lastly, I just really want to emphasize the importance of the word obey because we tend to, like I said, take it out of context and make it mean something else, negative at least. Um, to be obedient is really just showing that you love someone, that you honor and respect them because of that relationship, because you follow their voice. So when you think of the word obedient, obey, and you have a bad taste in your mouth because of that word or even some personal bad experience with it, I've had that. Don't worry about that. That voice, is, remember, is somebody else. Uh, it does not come from the Lord. The Lord only gives you feelings of positivity. The enemy only gives you feelings of negativity. So again, that discernment is super important in all aspects of life. So before we start accusing God of being bossy and demanding, let's just look at what he's trying to do for us in a parental lens because that's all he's doing. He's just being dad. He's just doing what we would do. We only do what he does because he gave the, us the example to live by. So that said, it totally makes sense that he would give his kids a reward system based on the fact that they listen to him, promise, keep their promise and their covenant to him. So like I said, it just it's really it's something that it makes sense that we do too. When our kids obey us, we totally have a reward system going for them so that we keep the momentum going so that we can show them how much we love them and how much we could do for them. So already now, without further ado, please give an attentive ear to Dr. Gibbs and stay tuned for my closing thoughts. I was in Alaska doing a lawsuit. We're way out in the Aleutian Islands, getting ready to leave and go back to Anchorage and then home. And I had a ticket in my pocket to get on an airplane. The pastor came up and he said, listen, I can save you money. I said, how's that? He said, I flew a small airplane up here and I fly a small airplane and I can take you in my little airplane and you can save your ticket. And this did not sound, I said, gee, thank you so very, very much, but I've got this ticket. We'll just make our way on home, me and this other lawyer with me. He said, no, 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 you got to do it. You got to do it. And against every better judgment I had, I said, okay. Well, we went out to the airport, took us by his little plane, and I looked at it. And I thought, well, one good thing, it's shiny. Then he walked around it. We got in. He's on the left front. I'm on the right front. The other lawyer's sitting right behind me. And he started it up. And it started up just fine. Well, we taxied out. I said, should we pray? He said, yeah, that's a good idea. We normally don't. I said, well, this time we're going <laughs> to. And I'm telling you, I prayed five, eight minutes. I prayed a long time. We went and got on the runway. He starts down the runway. The plane lifted off ever so gently, and we start climbing. And it's wonderful. Not a problem in the world. We started climbing, and we flew probably three, four minutes. And something happened that will never leave my mind. The pilot turned to me and he said, we're going in the clouds and I can't fly in clouds. They make me pass out. I said, clouds make you do what? <laughs> now it's been cloudy all day. And we go right up into the clouds and you can't see anything. And he looks at me and his eyes roll back in his head and he starts mumbling and he passes out passed out cold. Now I grabbed him and I shook him and I said, come on, you got to wake up so I can kill you. Now we're in the clouds flying along with no pilot. And my friend in the back seat said, we're dead, aren't we? I said, there's a very good chance of that. Yes. He said, what are we going to do? I said, I don't know. But there was a radio right there and I handed him the microphone and I said, start asking for help. So he's in the back seat reaching up and he said, hello, hello. We didn't know any proper radio etiquette. All we were saying was hello. And somebody answered back, hello, hello. Don't you guys know proper radio etiquette? And I said, give it to me. I said, Tell, we don't know nothing. Tell them we're in an airplane with a passed out pilot and we don't know how to fly this plane. The guy said, I'm a freighter flying out of Anchorage on the way to Tokyo. And he said, you're telling me you have nobody who can fly that plane with you? I said, tell them that's correct. Now you gotta understand, I am sweating bullets. He said, the first thing I'm gonna do is start circling so I don't lose you because I'll fly out of range of your radio and you won't have me anymore. 
And he said, I'm going to get Anchorage Emergency for you. And Anchorage Emergency will be the people that can maybe help you try to save your life. After about five minutes, Anchorage came on and said, we understand you have a passed out pilot. And those of you do not know how to fly that plane. We said, that's right. They said, well, the first thing we got to do is find you. And I'll never forget what this man at Anchorage said. He said, my job is to get you home safe. He said, that's my job. But he said, here's the deal. If you want me to get you home safe, you got to promise me you'll obey my voice. He said, you can't see me, but I can see you. And he said, if you're not going to obey my voice, you're going to die. When you can't see anything, you have no idea how disorientated you become. Finally, he said, okay, I found you. Now hear me clear. He said, you're four minutes from a mountain. He said, you're going to crash in that mountain and die. Follow my voice. I never said, I have to follow your voice. Is that reasonable? You see, I understood without his voice, I had nothing. And do you understand, without God's voice, you have nothing. Nothing. Finally, he got us turned. And he said, I'm freezing all the traffic in the area. He said, it's going to take me an hour and a half to get you to Anchorage. And there's a lot of weather between you and Anchorage. You're in for a rough ride. And he said, I want you to hear me. I don't want you to look at what's going on outside. I don't want you to pay attention to the storm, just my voice. He said, if you start watching the storm, you will die. But I'll take you through it. Now, because they cleared all the traffic, several pilots, those nighttime freighters, those 747s started talking to us. They said, we're praying for you, men. You're going to make it. But listen to the voice. That's the key. They said, trust the voice. Do you realize your head is full of voices? And everybody in this world wants to talk to you. And everybody wants to be the controlling voice. And God says, I want you to be a living sacrifice. I want you to put yourself on the altar and let my voice be your voice. Finally, we went through the worst of the weather, but there was still more. And then the voice came back and it said, now, I'm going to line you up. He said, I'm going to bring you in right down the runway. And at the foot of the runway are some lights and they're in the form of a cross. He said, don't you forget this. The cross is the way home. Finally, he's bringing us down. We still can't see anything. And all he kept saying is, stay with me. My sheep, the Bible says, hear my voice and they follow me. Finally, just a couple hundred feet off the ground, we saw the cross. I landed the plane. In fact, I landed it seven times. <laughs> Finally, it all came to a stop. And the minute we stopped, the pilot woke up. The voice said, thanks for listening. I watch them crash and burn all the time because they won't follow my voice. They don't understand I'm the one who can see them even when they can't see me. But they get the voices in their head and they kill themselves. They self-destruct. Thanks for listening to the voice. Then they put us in a motel room at about four in the morning. The knock at my door. And I opened the door and a man was standing there. He said, hello, David. I said, you're the voice. You're the one who got me home. He said, I am. Do you understand one day you're going to stand before him and say, you were the voice. You're the voice that brought me home. If you're not on that altar as a living sacrifice, your head's full of voices. And then we wonder why kids crash and burn. We wonder why marriages are shattered. And the Lord's saying, I'm the one who has the voice. All I can remember is that voice saying, stay with me. Stay with me. Don't listen to what's going on in your head and don't watch the storm. Stay with me. And I'll take you through. Tonight you have a God who has promised to take you through. A living sacrifice, holy. Wow, can I get an amen to that? 
What a fantastic, jaw-dropping testimony. I love how Dr. Gibbs was able to share his personal experience and how he was able to incorporate what was no doubt the most frightening thing ever into an emphasis on the importance of listening to God's voice. The voice so many of us so often don't care to utilize the discernment he gave us as he said so himself to know his voice and follow him that leads us and brings us into his peace, his comfort, and his sovereignty. And said we are only interested or pay more attention to the voices that please ourselves, that lead us into temptation, and then ultimately, just as Dr. Gibbs describes, our self-destruction. And as long as we're not in constant communication with God or not reading our Bibles, the enemy will always be two steps ahead of us, creating storms along our paths to keep us disoriented, keeping his voice leading our heart into sin and evil. And just to be clear, it's not that the enemy cares that we read our Bibles or go to church. It's when we use the discernment to listen for God's voice over his. When we want to make God's word applicable in our lives, and when we switch to that path, the enemy continuously sends out his special forces to keep fighting our spirits literally to the death. Hence why God is constantly giving us more than his word to turn from our wicked ways, but signs too. Signs so crystal clear like the runway approach lighting system that's in the form of a cross along with other things that are plain as day. So if we obey his voice, if we submit ourselves to Jesus, then no storm will ever take us down. The sight alone will not even scare us because he gives us a peace that surpasses all understanding. We even dance in the rain and sing over the thunder because God is merciful and sovereign. He takes care of those who believe in him. He said so himself that we will have an inheritance, an inheritance so awesome the human brain cannot even begin to imagine. And because Dr. Gibbs believes in Christ, he made it through the storm. God said, you're not dying today, not like this. And because you obey my voice, you will witness my mighty hand. You will see the impossible made possible. You will see my love for you and that no storm is too big for me because I have overcome the world and all the storms in it. So let these final words and questions sit with you. Whose voice are you obeying? Who are you trying to please? Yourself or the one who created you and has the means and ability and the love to protect you from the awaiting eternal isolation and torment of your soul all because of a choice. A foolish choice to dismiss and deny our Lord and Savior. So let's stop watering down his word and adjusting it to fit our own narrative. And when we do, because we genuinely want to repent, which just means to have a change of heart, his voice will then be the only voice. Don't shortchange yourself on a blissful eternity because we let our pride and stubbornness, even our ignorance, get in the way. It's not worth ignoring his voice to crash in a mountain, so to speak, when the voice was telling us it was there the whole time. Listen to the voice. Obey his voice. And don't forget, the cross is the way home. Alrighty, guys, thank you so much for giving both Dr. Gibbs and I the time to speak from the heart and for your willingness to open your heart to receive the message. It is appreciated more than you know. So if you liked the message or even just the quick painting, please be sure to not only share it, but to also hit like and subscribe for more videos. But more importantly, remember to thank God for this opportunity and always paint from the soul. See you next time. Bye.